Good morning. If you happen to need a Bible this morning, these fine gentlemen would love to put one in your hand, so uh, feel free to slip up your hand to make sure that you receive one. And uh, indeed, Happy New Year to each one of you this morning as we come together to, to worship the Lord. Um, someone asked me what I did last night. I did pretty much the same thing I always do. Went to bed at 10 o'clock and <laughs> slept all night. So <laughs> How many of you stayed up till midnight to see something? Was it interesting? I, I, I mean, the last time I stayed up till midnight, I, it was a mistake. It was just really not a great idea whatsoever. The most fun that I've ever had at um, New Year's Eve was back when I was a very young man. And my dad and I would go out working for the police departments. He was state and I was local. And we could see how many arrests we could make in the evening. And we had a big steak dinner riding on it, so that was kind of exciting and fun. Um, but since then, for the last 40 years, I've just prudently gone to sleep, I think. And uh, that's been it. So I wake up, and it's funny, when I woke up this morning, I thought, oh, I wonder if I have to turn the clocks ahead or backwards or something. And it was like, no, you really don't have to do anything at all. It was just really weird. And then not coming to church here for a 9 o'clock service, that adds weirdness on top of it. So, um, and then here I am, I'm going to do a topical message this morning, which is even more weird. So, but Happy New Year to you. We are looking this morning at several different places of Scripture. Happy New Year. It's, it's fun. We stop and we think about the new year and we think about, about time. And this morning I want to talk to you about the efficiency of God. Because we live in a day when everything is driven, it seems, in our culture here in America by efficiency. We are severely irritated if the line doesn't move fast enough. Isn't it true? I mean, how many of us like to wait in line? Thank goodness we have cell phones now that make waiting more palatable. Now, if you don't have your cell phone, I mean, and it has to be a smartphone because we've got to make the most of every single minute. How many of you got those Fitbit type watches for Christmas this year? Anybody? Mm, I'm preaching to the wrong audience. <laughs> I thought for sure someone would have gotten one of those things. Evidently, they're really cool. I mean, it tells you how long you sleep. It tells you when you roll over at night. It tells you all kinds of things you didn't know about yourself, what your favorite color is and what your favorite TV is. It tells you all of that, and it's right there on your wrist. And uh, we, we live in a world that's absolutely uh, consumed by efficiency. We spend countless hours, and there's whole think tanks that are deliberating on the significance of our life and what we can accomplish in the time in which we have to live. Well, 2017 is an interesting year. I've never been through this, and neither have you before. We don't know what's coming. It could be the year of our Christ's return. Trumpet could sound, and it could be all over for us here on this earth, and we could be in his presence then for eternity. Wouldn't that be great? I take you to a passage of scripture, just actually a verse of scripture, to kind of get us kicked off and, and thinking in a particular direction. Would you take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter this morning and verse chapter 3 and verse 8? I want you to think about efficiency. I want you to think about how efficient you like to be. This is the time of the year when we are awash and rethinking all different aspects of our life. This is when you start your new exercise program. This is when you finally break out that book on dieting that you haven't looked at in two years. This is the day you decide to do something different. And so this morning, I want to challenge us and take this opportunity, hence the reason for a topical message, because this opportunity does not come along that often. And so this morning, we want to take a look at efficiency. How many of you would like to be more efficient with your time in this next year? Very good. Thank you for helping me out. <laughs> I got to say, I was pretty nervous asking a second question. What I want to show you is this morning as we look at the scriptures, 
that God's idea of efficiency is far, far different than ours. In fact, what I want to show you is that in the American mindset, the efficiency of God is way off the mark. It doesn't make a lot of sense at times. But let me underscore this by turning here to chapter 3 and verse 8 first and just looking here that what Peter is saying, he says, do not let this one fact escape your notice. Beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. Now, Peter goes out of his way, and you're understanding this. It is God whose Holy Spirit is directing this. So this isn't Peter's made-up words. He wrote it down, but this is God's word. And what God says is, don't miss this one fact, Kevin. Be sure that you understand this about time. The time that is transpiring on earth is different than time sequence in heaven. They are dramatically different, so much so that one day in heaven is like a thousand years down here. Do you realize that it's been 10 years since D.J. Kennedy went home to be with the Lord and Jerry Falwell went home to be with the Lord? 10 years, 2017. And I wonder what they've been doing up there uh, we have loved ones that have been up there. Our daughter's been up there for five years. And so we always do the math to try to figure out how much that is in God's time versus our time. And you realize she's been up there about 22 minutes. It's interesting when you try to break out this whole viewpoint and how God views time versus how we view time. In Psalms, there's a Psalm of Moses that exclaims that a thousand years in God's sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or it's like a watch in the night. To us, a millennium, a thousand years, seems like an enormously long time, and yet with God it is but one day. And so I encourage us to stop and think about this because there is a lot of radical thoughts that, that hit you as you look at how terribly, and understand this is not what I'm truly saying, I'm tongue in cheek, but how terribly inefficient God's time is. Stop and think about it. 4,000 years that take place before Jesus comes. Man falls into sin all the way back in the book of Genesis. It takes 4,000 years for the Redeemer to come and walk this earth. Now, you might ask yourself the question, why did it take 4,000 years? Why didn't God do it in like 20 years? Hmm. It takes another 2,000 years for the church to carry on. Oft times the church being disobedient in these 2,000 years. 2,000 years, we're waiting for the rapture. I'm guessing that if the rapture and its timing was left up to you and me, we would push the button today. Come Lord Jesus would be our desire. We want instant everything, don't we? We farm with a vengeance. Big tractors pushing out food that's been <laughs> treated in such a way and seeds that do things that they never did before. You flash back and you go back to an Amish culture and you look at them and they've got the horses out there and they're plowing it under. It's a, a totally different way of thinking. But I want you to think about this with me, and I hopefully it'll come to a conclusion, it'll really get us to think as we walk out of here today. When you think of people, and you think how God made people, would you not agree that if it was the American culture that was in charge of making people, that people would be far different than they are? A little baby deer is born. It takes a very short period of time, only hours, until that baby deer can stand up. 
I watched a little baby deer this summer running around trying to stay with a bunch of other deer. It was the most comical thing you saw. All little legs going in all different types of directions. But it was only probably a month or so old. And here it was, running along. As crazy as it looked, it was still out there running. It still needed its mother, but it was progressing. How about babies here in the human world? We spent a couple days with our grandkids. One can walk and one can't. One's coming along. But it's been months, and he still doesn't eat any ice cream. And the other one's almost two years old, and he can't dribble a basketball yet. The inefficiencies of humanity, the animal kingdom, they're doing it. They're out there cranking around, looking for food. In two years' time, they're already grown. We look there at this, and we amaze ourselves. These little children. Can you imagine if parents were in charge of this whole maturing process? I mean, I'd have that kid potty trained in two days. I'm serious, you stop and you think about it, I mean, they'd be living on their own in five years. You know, wouldn't that be great instead of like 30 years? We could really change things up. I mean, stop and think about the efficiency of your life. How much do you remember about the first 10 years of your life? You don't remember a whole lot, do you? Were they wasted years? Second 10 years you remember because you did so many stupid things. But the first 10 years of your life, you might not remember that much. Well, wouldn't it be better if we could just speed up that whole process and make it days and months instead of years that are are wasted? Wouldn't you love to get back your sixth year this year? Well, maybe, maybe not. Think about our bodies and, and just how much time we have to sleep every single day. You want to talk about becoming more efficient, you need to dump the sleep. You spend one-third of your life, that's what those mattress commercials say, you spend one-third of your life sleeping. And what are you doing when you're sleeping? Nada. It's wasted time. Cut it back. Cut it back this year to maybe two, three hours max (laughs) and see if you don't get done a whole lot more. Get some toothpicks for those eyes. You say, God, why did he make us this way that it requires seven, eight, nine hours of sleep? Have you ever wondered that? Why didn't the creator make us with greater efficiency than that? And then there's that whole one day and seven rest thing that we don't do anymore. The principle of one day in seven, that rest, is significant. And somewhere along the line, that's been lost, hasn't it? Somewhere along the line, when we recognize that we don't worship on the Sabbath, we come together to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do that on the first day of the week. And so uh, that whole principle of one day in seven is oftentimes lost. In fact, there are churches that have services on Saturday now and some churches on Sunday. And so you, you can fill your calendar. There's no gaps. There's no place for rest. Imagine if we were to redesign things. Imagine how much more we could get done. Kids mature at a younger age, retirement gets pushed off. Uh, I mean, it's amazing how much more productivity we could get out. The economy would go through the roof. Just thinking about this makes me excited. It seems that God just uses people with a very different emphasis on efficiency than we Americans would. I want to give you some biblical examples of inefficiency. Okay? So let's take our Bibles. Let's go over to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 5. I won't take you to every passage here this morning. I just want to pull out several different things to get you thinking perhaps this morning. In Genesis chapter 5, this is a biblical example of inefficiency in the mind of an American. We're introduced to a man named Enoch. Enoch is alive during a time that is pre-diluvian. It's pre-flood. 
which all you need to know about that time period is that people lived a long, long time. We've got people that are pushing a thousand years in age. And we come to Enoch, and the Bible tells us about Enoch. Enoch, it says in verse 19 that Jared lived 800 years after he became the father of Enoch. And he had other sons and daughters, so all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. You may recall, Methuselah lives 969 years. But his father, Enoch, walked with God 300 years after he became Methuselah's dad. And he also had other sons and daughters. This means that Enoch, who is a man who is walking with God, lives 365 years. Have you ever wondered why he didn't live to be 900 or 1,000? If these other rascals might be living 900, why didn't he live to be 1,500 years? But the Bible tells us that he walked with God in verse 24, and he was not, for God took him. You see, God called Enoch home in the midst of his prime, as it were, as a young man. He calls Enoch home. 365 years, that's all. Where's the efficiency of God? Wouldn't you look at that and say, I'm going to take one of these other rascals home, and I'm going to allow him to stay here. But not true in God's mind. Noah is another one who follows right after this in this passage of Scripture. Over in chapter 7, we read in verse 6 that Noah was 600 years old, when the flood of water came upon the earth. So Noah is actually 500 years old when God comes to Noah and tells Noah that there is going to be a flood and he needs to build an ark. He builds the ark. It takes 100 years off of his life building that boat. 100 years. Now stop and think about that. Noah in all, lived 950 years. But about all we remember about Noah is the fact that he planted a vineyard and he built an ark. Think what we could accomplish if we lived 950 years. We could build all kinds of boats. We could do all kinds of things. If God would just give us 950 years, maybe we'd be more known more uh, than just having built a boat and planted a vineyard. Abraham, the next one in the sequence. Let me just say this. Abraham was 75 years old before God even starts working with him. Now, that's a lot better than than 500 years, but it's still a very long time. He is promised a son when he is 75, but he's 100 by the time he has the son. He's 99 years old when he is circumcised and then when his son is finally born. That's 25 years that go by from the time when God calls him out to the whole circumcision and this child being born. And there are people who are dying without any hope at all. Where is the efficiency of God? What did Abraham achieve during those 25 years? Have you ever wondered that? I mean, was, did he have a planner? Did he have, you know, appointments? Was he busy? What was he doing those 25 years? Let's think about Joseph. You remember Joseph? Coat of many colors, ends up in Egypt. There's a famine in Israel, his family comes down, by now he's pretty highly ranked. Joseph is one of these sharp, sharp young men. He is intelligent, he is honest as the day is long, he can be trusted, he has high moral standards. You recall Potiphar's wife and all that scandal, he leaves his coat in her hand and out the door he goes. Why? Because he is a moral, decent man. But then he ends up in a dungeon. Do you remember that? He ends up in a dungeon there on a false charge. 
And, and he's there for most of the time in his 20s. He's a, he's a young man. He's got so much to offer. And he ends up there. And, and you may remember that there's a, a situation with the cupbearer and the cupbearer is let free, and, and he says, uh, Joseph says to him, you know, remember me when you get out, and maybe you remember that he didn't remember. And Joseph was stuck there, and he's going on and on there. And you may recall in Genesis 41 that Pharaoh has a dream which leads to Joseph being let out of this prison. The Bible says there in Genesis 41 in verse 1, now it happened at the end of two full years. That's two full years from the time of the cupbearer's release until Pharaoh has his dream. These are two of the choicest years of Joseph's life. Have you ever wondered to yourself, why did God let him there for two years before Pharaoh had the dream? Why wasn't it two days? Why after two days didn't Pharaoh have his dream and then Joseph was let out? Where's the efficiency of God leading well, there are many, many illustrations in Scripture that follow this pattern. Israel is in bondage to Egypt for 400 years. Moses is 40 years old when God finally calls him, but he kills the Egyptian, and the next thing you know, he's 40 years on the backside of the desert, and what is he doing? He's 80 years old by the time he comes out. He leads the people out, and he dies at the age of 120, never getting to see the promised land. An 11-day walk took 40 years. Why couldn't Moses have been 20 years old when God called him? Why did he have to go and spend 40 years on the backside of that desert? Why didn't he just spend four months there? Why couldn't he have led the people of Israel out sooner? Why couldn't there have been more efficiency? And you remember King David? King David's born about 1025 B.C. For those of you who are, are here and you're in the Joshua study, you know uh, next week we're in Joshua chapter 8. We're getting into AI, doing it the right way. And uh, we said 1400 B.C. is when the people of Israel crossed over that Jordan River. Here we are in 1025 B.C. This is when King David is born. He is anointed then. Uh, 1035 he's born. 1025 he's bo he is anointed king of Israel. The mantle has been taken away, in God's mind, away from Saul, and David's going to be the next king. Do you know how many years it took for David to be able to assume that throne? It doesn't happen until 933 B.C. That's over 30 years. 30 years. We're still wrestling around with that rascal Saul. He's throwing javelins at David and carrying on. And all that while, David could have been the king. Uh, David is a man who personally knows God in a deep and intimate way. I just read through some of those psalms. I was reading Psalm 145 uh, just this past week, and I was just amazed at the depth of relationship that King David has with God Almighty. Why didn't he get to the throne sooner than that? Stop and think about John the Baptist with me. Take your Bibles. Go with me to Matthew chapter 11. First book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 11. And verse 11. This is what Jesus said about John the Baptizer. He said this. He said, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now that's a pretty high mark, isn't it? Do you realize that John the Baptizer uh, was a very anointed man? He had six months of ministry before Herod put him in prison. And then one night, Herod got drunk lusting after a dancing girl, promised her anything she wanted, and that was John the baptizer's head on a platter. I think to myself, if this man that Jesus calls out in Matthew eleven eleven is this well-regarded, there has not been a man like him, born of a woman, 
Can you imagine what John would have accomplished in ministry if he was allowed to have 30, 40, 50 years? But he doesn't even start his ministry until he's a young man. Now stop and think about that. And his ministry only spans six months. Is that amazing? It is amazing. Apostle Paul, same could be say, said of him. He was saved in 36 AD on the Damascus Road. He is the most knowledgeable man alive when it comes to Old Testament scriptures. He is a student of the word par excellence. And yet what happens after he comes to, to see the light there on the Damascus Road? Well, he goes to Damascus. He's teaching the people. And then what happens to him? We find out he doesn't even write about it until Galatians in 53 uh, AD that God had taken him out to the desert and ministered to him for three years. Oh, you say, come on. If I was in charge of this, there wouldn't be any training period of time for him. He could just get going. Get that ministry cranking. But alas, that was not God's plan. Lastly, I want you to think about Jesus. Jesus wasn't just any child, was he? When Jesus goes to the temple and he starts teaching, the first opportunity he has, how old is he? 12 years old. If you were Jesus' parents, if you were Jesus' parents, you could make him a preacher, couldn't you, right away? I mean, he's already tying the, the religious leaders in Jerusalem up in knots. He's there, and they're already amazed at what he's saying. This is when, you remember when they were looking for him, where did Jesus go? And they went back, and now there he is, there in the temple. Uh, Jesus ends up doing carpentry work. Carpentry work. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, that's like sawing boards and stuff, right? He's making furniture. And your mind thinks to yourself, I wonder, I just wonder how many more people he might have been able to heal if he didn't need to do that. He doesn't start that earthly ministry till he's how old? 30 years old. And it only spans about three years. And it's done. But the Bible will tell us in John 17 in verse 4 that he accomplished everything the Father had for him to do. John 17, 4. I want you to know that what we're not talking about here is wasted time. Because in our sovereign Lord's planning and in his mind, there's no such thing as wasted time. God has a plan, doesn't he? And he's working that plan. In fact, we would say that wasting time is wickedness. That would be wrong. You shouldn't waste time in 2017, and hopefully we won't waste time. But when we stop and we think about God's planning, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9 come to mind. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. You see, the inefficiencies allegedly that we've looked at, the questions that come to mind were all part of God's perfect plan. So that when Jesus came, it was the fullness of time. It was right down to the second. It was planned that way. You see, the problem for us as Americans is we oftentimes misunderstand what efficiency truly is. We feel like if we're not busy all of the time, we're not getting done the things that God wants us to get done. And so we live in a world where busyness is oftentimes mistaken for, product, pro, for productivity. You see, God is at work. And what God wants to accomplish in our hearts and minds, in those years on the backside of the desert, in those preparatory years that God is ministering to Moses, there are many mighty things that are happening. Even in Jesus' childhood development and all of those things, even in John the Baptist's heart and life, there are things happening that you and I don't see. Let me just give you by way of application this morning three things to stop and think of. One is, in this new year, make time to walk with God like Enoch did. Make time to walk with God. Take your Bibles and go with me over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us 
something special about Enoch. In chapter 11 and verse 5, it says, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Do you realize sometimes God takes people home because he wants to have direct fellowship with them there? That's part of God's plan. You and I may grieve over it. You and I may not see it the same way, but God knows exactly what he is doing. The walk that Enoch had with God is not a walk that could be entered into hurriedly. When we walk with God, it is absolutely essential for us to understand that it's going to take time. This is a relationship that we have with God that, that you can't just squeeze into a little box. And the same application with regard to our walk with God can be applied to our time with our families. Specifically, the time that parents spend with children. You know the old argument, we spend quality time together. And you might say to yourself the same argument with regard to your walk with God. I spend quality time with God. I come to church on Sunday morning and I worship God. And that's quality time. And the rest of the week I do whatever I want to do. But I'll come back next Sunday most times. And I'll have that quality time. Worship is an outwardly inefficient activity. Spend time in prayer. Spending time in prayer is viewed as something very inefficient by most people. It's not looked up to. It's not so, well, that's wonderful. It's like, okay, now that that's done, what do you, let's get going, right? You remember when Mary broke the alabaster box and anointed Jesus? And those in the group thought, this is a waste. This is a total waste. You see, worship is going to, at times, be messy. There are many in the Christian community who are seeking, with the same American mentality towards efficiency, a church or a religion or some type of faith that will instantly gratify them in some meaningful way. And yet the deep writers who have written about Scripture, and I could name a whole bunch of people right now, but I won't, but, but you read some of these deep writers who have a, a real intense walk with God, and you realize that it is not something that comes about in three easy steps. When you read David and you read his, his Psalms and, and you look at the, the depth of the relationship that he has with God, it just flies off the page that this is a man who spends his days walking with God. I meet Christians who ask me, well, there's got to be more to this whole Christian thing, right, Pastor Kevin? Like what? Oh, I don't know, there's just got to be more, you know? And so I, I'm going to go someplace where they're doing this. The reality is that this worship of God and this walking with God is going to take time, and you and I need to make time for that to happen. You remember the illustration in Luke chapter 10, we won't go there, but Mary and Martha... Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet as Jesus is teaching. Martha's whipping around, getting the food out, making sure the place is clean, greeting guests, and doing all those other things. And she's all ticked off at Mary. Why? What is Mary doing? Mary is doing nothing but absorbing the words of Jesus. And you and I have to create that opportunity to walk with God in a quieted environment where we can spend time thinking about God. I'm always amazed at when I get busy and sidetracked and I finally come back and say, oh, Lord, I've been away from you, and I start to pray. It's almost like, wow, how did I get so far away in such a short period of time? Seems like we haven't talked forever, Lord. And that's when the relationship needs to be cemented together. Make time to walk with God as Enoch did. Second of all, 
in this new year, invest your life in others. Invest your life in others. Most, most of us won't get to later points in our life and turn around and say, man, I wish I would spent more time at work because I think it could have been better for me. The regrets usually don't roll out that way, do they? The regrets roll out, boy, I wish I'd spent more time with others. Spending time with your family. Very, very important that that happens. And remember this, because I think this is a, a, a total lie that's being foisted upon America, that there's some type of, well, quality time versus quantity time when it comes to our kids. Okay, kids, we're going to have this good time. Ready? <sighs> Was it good? Oh, great. Oh, oh. Kids don't relate that way. They relate over long periods of time. And there needs to be a point in time when we recognize that. Now, let me just say this. It's encouraging to, to take time for family vacations and getting away and doing those things. I encourage you to do those things. But let me just say this. Be intentional with your time. You are, especially if you're a parent or a grandparent, you are given a responsibility to teach your children and those around you about God. Teach them about the Savior. As a parent, my, my specific role was to lead my children to a relationship with Jesus Christ. I didn't always see it as it truly was. But there needs to be an intentionality about what we're doing as parents and grandparents. I want to see my grandkids come to faith in Christ. I pray to that end, and I pray that I will be useful in seeing that happen. There needs to be an intentionality. It almost seems like in our culture we're more, we're more geared towards other things in raising our kids. We want to see them be successful here and there, and we're not at that intentional about their spiritual development. Investing your life in others not only includes your family, but I believe it also includes God's family. You know, in the book of Hebrews, it tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as you see the day of the Lord approaching even more. And we need to do that. We need to be involved in one another's lives, encouraging each other. Amen? We need to be encouraging each other to, to, and provoking each other, the Bible says, to, to love and good works. Encouraging each other during the time that God has given to us. Very important, but it's all investing ourselves in the lives of others. You see, when you get to the end, you won't look back and regret any of that. You won't have regret the time that you've spent drawing close to God. You won't regret the time that you spent encouraging family and friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. You won't regret any of that. Because there is eternal dividends that are going to be paid for doing just that. The last thing we want to do is in this next year is take time to share our faith. Letting others know the hope that is within us. It's a wonderful thing to join together and worship the Lord on Sunday mornings like this, isn't it? Fantastic. But there are people out in the marketplace that don't know our Jesus. Can you believe that? There are people that have no idea what Jesus truly did. They got more knowledge about Santa Claus than they have about Jesus Christ. And you and I are to be messengers and take the message of the gospel into a world that so desperately needs to hear it. The summary here is just like the great commandment. That we will love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and might and our neighbors as ourselves. Teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. May 2017 be a year of progress in our spiritual lives. May we look back on this day in 365 more days 
and say that we were truly intentional in these areas of our spiritual life. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, let me urge you today to stop and give that serious consideration. Because Jesus Christ is the one true Savior of the world. He came and he died so that we might have eternal life. Jesus made it very clear, if you believe on me, you'll have that eternal life. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? What a, what a fantastic year you'll have this year. If you've never made that decision, if today you call upon the name of the Lord and you're saved. May God work in all of our hearts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for in light of all the things that you have done, we see your marvelous sovereignty. We see your wisdom, Lord, as you have directed the affairs of men over the years. Lord, help us not to think of ourselves in any wise way. For Lord, we truly know that your efficiency is perfect. And in all of those perceived delays on our part, Lord, you were working mightily. And we rejoice in that. Father, today we would desire for the return of Jesus Christ to take place. But Lord, we know that you who are rich in love and mercy are delaying because people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Father, how we would want you to delay for us if we were not yet believers. And so, Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who's yet to place their faith in Christ, that today would be that day of decision. For your children here, Lord, I pray that we would set time aside to grow close to you. That we might have some inkling, Lord, of what it means to have that type of fellowship that, that Moses had with you. Father, I think of the difficulties that Moses had and the times that stressed him out. And yet, Father, his one quest in life was to see and behold your glory to a greater degree because he loved you so much. Father, may you truly allow the passion of our heart to be like Jesus, to know you more. May this be a year, Lord, where you are glorified greatly. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we are given the passage of Scripture that describes the Lord's Supper. We have the bread before us this morning that represents Jesus' broken body on the cross. We have the cup that represents Jesus' blood that was shed. In the Gospels, Jesus would talk about himself and he would say, I am the bread of life. He would say, he that comes and eats of me will have eternal life. And the same for the cup. You and I this morning participate in receiving these elements and we are demonstrating that we are receiving Christ and have received Christ as Savior. That our faith is in him. That our belief that redemption is real is solidified by that faith relationship we have with Christ. And we now are aligned properly with God. This morning as we take of these elements, my prayer is that we would understand that we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. That we would understand this morning that this is not a sacrament, but it's an observation. And it's a demonstration that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. How wonderful that truly is. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, come and take of me, he was speaking of those who have a relationship with him. For this reason, the Bible gives us a warning here in 1 Corinthians 11 that if you are not yet a person of faith, that you just hold off from taking these elements. For the Bible instructs us that way and tells us to be careful in receiving these elements if we are not in a faith relationship with Christ. But the Bible says, but let a man examine himself, 
And in so doing, he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. I would ask you at this time, if you would just bow your head with me, please, as we stop and we contemplate the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. The relationship that we treasure and love. Ed's going to pray and ask the blessing on the bread this morning. Father, we, we come this morning and we are full of joy and full of sorrow. Lord, we are full of joy for the simple fact that the payment that you made covered our transgressions. And Lord, we are also filled at the same time with sorrow, realizing that it was because of what we have done that you had to give of yourself for us. Lord, we again thank you. Lord, we, we again ask that, Father, during this time of remembrance, that we remember the love that it took, the power that it took, and Lord, also the simple fact that you did this for us because we could not do it for ourselves. Lord, help us to be proclaimers of this truth as we leave here today. Help us as we speak to people to be able to give them hope because it is a simple fact that we have all fallen short of your glory. And by what you have done, we can be brought back into the fold. Lord, as we think about the stripes that are on your back, as we think about the beating that you took, we are sad. But when we think about what has been brought about because of it, Lord, we rejoice with the angels of heaven and thank you.